Thank you for that singing. Uh, please open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We are looking at matters of first importance. You remember, Paul says that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that on the third day He rose again according to the Scriptures. And he says these are matters of primary importance. You're building a case for faith. You put these right down there as bedrocks. This thing about Jesus died and was buried is often referred to as the empty tomb. We spent time on that last week. I believe the tomb was found empty. It's so important and so well known. Sometimes you'll even see a bumper sticker with the slogan, saved by the empty tomb. But the New Testament doesn't put a lot of emphasis on the empty tomb. If you remember, the empty tomb in the gospel stories led to fear and panic. My friend Matthew Love, who preaches for the BB Church of Christ, made a very great observation in a bulletin article a few years back. He contrasted the empty tomb with the New Testament emphasis on an encounter with the risen Christ. It is true that the tomb was found empty, and that's necessary. But read the accounts again. What does experiencing the empty tomb produce? For the first followers of Jesus, it produces bewilderment, fear, and they end up hiding behind locked doors. The absence of a body in a hollowed out tomb is not a standalone teaching at the heart of the Christian faith. Paul mentions the tomb in passing. It is a matter of first importance. But notice, it wasn't the empty tomb that produced hope in the heart of believers. It was their encounter with the risen Christ. The sight of the empty tomb brings fear and panic, but visions or appearances of Jesus. And Paul says, this too is a matter of first importance. He died, he was buried, he rose, and he was seen. It's interesting that he names a number of ways in which Jesus was seen. One of the arguments out there for why you shouldn't believe this is the argument of mass hallucination. They say, look, we know people who have had a loved one, who they've had close to them their whole life, and then they pass away. And there are stories that they see them again the next day because they're so used to having them around the house. They they have visions of them. And this is very common when you experience the loss of someone close to you. And that's what's going on here. This is hallucination. That's very, very hard to square with a couple of historical uh, arguments. For example, there's good reason to think that these experiences were something. When you're looking at ancient history, what you look at is, does somebody make a claim? Yes, they do. Claim broad enough that it's not something like something happened yesterday, but nobody could ever prove or disprove it. Or is it more like this, which is something happened to several of us, and you could go ask them today, which is what the argument is. The argument is that the appearances happen to living people. You can counter it. And there's no evidence that anybody ever countered it. Historians will look at things like this to establish credible testimony that something happened. There's good reason to think something happened. Well, now, what was that thing that happened? Notice the diversity of the appearances. It's not just to people who had a longing to see him again because they believed. It was also to people like James, his brother, who didn't believe. Normally, these these hallucinations happen because I have a longing to see someone, and thus I create the image in my mind. You don't have that experience with someone who doesn't believe he's the Messiah and doesn't expect him to rise from the dead. You also have this interesting case in which it was not a common view in Judaism that any Messiah was going to rise from the dead other than the the resurrection when everybody will rise from the dead. So it doesn't even fit the preceding pattern. I remember hearing someone say one time, oh, this is like those UFO sightings. Everybody's always talking about the UFO and they always look the same, right? Yeah, I saw a UFO and it looked just like that movie I saw of 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 an alien uh, not that long ago. But how different would it be if on the same night you hear calls in London 
and in New York and in Searcy. And independently, they all say, I saw this thing and it had a red dot on its right toe. Well, now we've got something interesting. It doesn't fit a preconceived pattern of expectation and it's diverse and these people are separated. It's more like that. We're not expecting a risen Messiah in our lifetime. We have to redo our theology once that happens. And I'm not somebody expecting the resurrection because I'm not a believer, but it happened to me too. And then add to this, he says it happened to 500 brethren at once. This claim of this large group, some of whom are still living, Paul says, the kind of thing you don't say if you're making this up. Besides which, he appeared to women who were the first to testify. Did you know that in some writings, the testimony of a donkey was considered of higher priority than the testimony of a woman in a Jewish court? And when you're telling this story, if you're making it up, you don't produce the primary witnesses who couldn't even testify in court. It doesn't read like a made-up story or like hallucinations. It reads like something real. I believe the appearances were real. But I want to go further than that. I want to apply this to us today. Matthew Love, writing in his, uh, I told you he was writing this bulletin article. Listen to this. If the empty tomb changes nothing, then what does? The answer is meeting the resurrected Lord. It's only then in the Gospels that the disciples' lives are transformed. Doubts persist. But without encountering the risen Christ, there is no transformation. The issue today is not whether one knows the tomb is empty, but whether one has met the resurrected Lord. The resurrection is not solely about the absence of death found in the empty tomb, but the presence of life. The empty tomb simply leaves space for the living Lord. Now, if you were raised like I was, finding language about meeting Jesus or having a personal experience with Christ might sound a little peculiar. What in the world does this mean? We need to do justice to the biblical text first and then talk about what that means for us today. And the first thing I want you to notice is that having a personal experience, an encounter with Jesus forms the basis of the first Christian witness. Listen to the experiential language in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. I'm going to read it in a translation you don't normally use, so you can hear it perhaps for the first time. From the very first day, we were there, taking it all in. We heard it with our own ears, saw it with our own eyes, verified it with our own hands. The word of life appeared right before our eyes. We saw it happen. And now we're telling you in most sober prose that what we witnessed was incredibly this. The infinite life of God himself took shape before us. We saw it. We heard it. And now we're telling you so you can experience it along with us. This experience of communion with the Father and his son, Jesus Christ. I want to say that again. We saw it. We heard it, and now we're telling you so you can experience it along with us. This experience of communion with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. What about 2 Peter chapter 1? We didn't follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus in power. We were eyewitnesses of His majesty. On Pentecost Day, Peter tells the crowd, Experiencing the inbreaking of God's spirit, God raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. When Christ called Paul to be an apostle, he charged apostle to serve as a witness, not only to past events, but also to present and future experiences of Christ. Listen to Acts 26. I am Jesus, and I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. Now, I want to make something clear. There was something very special and very unique about being an eyewitness. Remember when Peter told Cornelius, we're witnesses of everything he did in his earthly ministry? 
He then says, but he wasn't seen by all the people, but by witnesses who God had already chosen by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. This personal encounter that was had by some people at a particular point in history was so powerful, it launched the Christian movement. And this vision, uh, experience of Jesus, was retained vividly in their memory. It formed the heart of their early witness to the truth of the gospel. Jesus knew the power of personal encounter. After rising from the grave, Jesus made several stops along the way. He makes his personal appearance to his followers, often sharing a meal with them as a way of reminding them of his presence and his care. When Jesus finds his disciples hurting and struggling, he runs to them, to Thomas. He doesn't just say, I've risen. He says, look at my hands. Stick your finger in my side. Let's touch and feel. When Peter needed one last chance to say, I'm sorry, Jesus invites him over for breakfast. A disciple named Clopas needs to see Jesus in Luke's gospel. So Jesus walks beside him and stays for dinner. And whether it's like Peter in the early morning or Thomas at noon or Clopas in the evening, Jesus makes himself known to troubled hearts. And these encounters make a lasting impact. I think it's interesting that the story of Clopas and the other disciple, we don't know their name in Luke, after the resurrection of Jesus, who are walking along the way and they encounter Jesus. They don't know it's Jesus. They start talking to him. He stays for dinner. Jesus breaks the bread and then he disappears among them. And the text says they looked at each other and said, weren't our hearts burning within us? And I wonder if early Christians would read that and say, when we gather to take the Lord's Supper and we know that he's there with us and we're talking about Christ and the experience we've had of living a life with him and for him and I see Christ in you and you see Christ in me and we hear the preached word and we're talking to him in prayer and we talk about how our lives have been changed by God's spirit. Aren't our hearts burning within us? Jesus said he'd be with us always. I've never heard his audible voice. I've never been visited by Jesus in my living room. If you think that's where I was going, that's not where I'm going. But I do think that in the New Testament, God's Holy Spirit three times is called the Spirit of Christ. And Christ said, I will be with you. I will be in you. I'll make my home with you. And he believes in the power of experience. I experience the presence and power of Jesus when I see someone surrender their life in baptism and I witness a profound event. I experience the presence and power of Jesus when two or three of my brothers and sisters put their arms around me and pray for me in the middle of my troubles. I experience the presence and power of Jesus when a brother in Christ shows up at my doorstep with a cup of cold water in my hour of need. You experience the presence and power of Jesus when you join with others in doing good, when you help someone learn to read or get a hot meal for the first time in a long time, or help fight injustice or introduce them to the gospel. The Spirit, wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, is the Spirit of Jesus. And doing spiritual things with spiritual people is a way to encounter and experience the living Lord. Jesus one time said, what you do or don't do to the least of these, my brothers. You know how it finishes? You do to me. I just think it's beautiful to think that as Christians, we wear the name of Christ. We house the spirit of Christ. We walk in the footsteps of Christ. We worship and pray in the power of Christ. And we live with the assurance of the abiding presence of Christ. And would to God that we would all live in the constant recognition of his powerful presence in our lives. I've not had one moment that can compare to what John Wesley talks about in his biography, where he says he was sitting by the fire and at a certain time he felt his heart strangely warmed. I don't have one of those stories, but like you, I've got a hundred stories where I heard someone give their testimony how God changed their life at the front of a church building 
or at a camp or at a youth rally. Or I watched someone who used to be, I had an elder once in a church who had been the town drunk when he was younger, but was now an elder in God's church. And I heard him tell his story. Or I've seen people in my own life become better, become better husbands, better wives, better parents because of what Christ is doing in them. And I can't help but think I'm witnessing something holy. The experience of Christ is important. And may I suggest that if you want to know the primary place where you can go to experience Christ, he meant for it to be in the church. This is where the people of God gather. The spirit dwells in us corporately as well as individually. You don't have to have supernatural abilities to catch the thrill of serving a Lord who is alive, who walks with us day by day to be inspired to speak of your life with Christ as your experience of Christ. May we speak of our experience in the water of baptism. We take our whole body and we unite with the death of Christ. And in receiving the spirit, we're empowered to walk by, by him and to live by his work. At the communion table, we sup with the risen Christ in our Christian neighbor as they forgive us when we wrong them or as they hear us confess to one another in the name of Christ. In the conviction that comes from hearing God's word proclaimed in the truth of Christ. In the circle of prayer as an assembled people when we talk about the hope of Christ. Our experience in the way that our addictions have been broken or our selfishness has been lessened. God's spiritual fruit has been brought to full bloom as we yield ourselves to his spirit. These are examples of how we have met Christ. How we see him feel him, and know him. It's a real thing. And it's a way for us to talk that I think connects us with our spiritual forefathers who said, we saw him, we touched him, we felt him, and now I'm writing to you so you can experience with us what it's like to be in the presence of our living Lord.